welcome to the Books on Asia podcast, sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years. Located at www.stonebridge.com. And I'm your host, Amy Chavez. And today, I'm talking with Juliet Winters Carpenter about translating Japanese literature. I am talking with Juliet Winters Carpenter, who absolutely everyone is familiar with. And even if you're not, I bet you have read one of the books she has translated, because mm. she's translated over 70 books, and all at that time, as well as raising a family. So mm -hmm. this is Superwoman I have with me here today. Thank you, and it's so nice to finally meet you, Juliet. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to meet you, too. I'm yeah. a big fan of your columns. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. That's very nice. This is really a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me to meet you because I know you're leaving Japan. I'll be hanging around. You won't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> oh, that is so nice to hear. That's really wonderful. I wanted to talk about just translation in general and how one can possibly translate over 70 books while raising a family. Give me some insight on this. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, looking back, it seems it does seem kind of impossible because you have to put your family first, let's face it. So there would be long stretches where I wouldn't be translating anything in particular or just doing small articles, things like that. But I was always keeping my oar in. And then if something did come along, then I would I could devote myself to it. But it's it's kind of picked up. And now that my husband is retired and the kids have left home, so... I, I, I'm always working on several projects at once. And you plan on oh, continuing. Yeah. yeah. But the thing that was good is my husband is an early to rise kind of guy. And I'm more of a night owl. So it was really convenient because about 9 o'clock he would hit the hay. And then that would be my time. Because the kids, when they were little too, they would be in bed or doing their homework or whatever it was. But in the evening they didn't need me at that point so much. I would often work from 9 at night till 3 in the morning. Wow, and that time is so necessary. I totally quiet, get that. Yeah. You know, for writing or yeah. translating, you need heaps of just silent time where yeah. you don't have to do anything else. Nobody's going to call you at two in the morning. And, yeah, yeah, that's one reason I love living on a small island. Is, mm. uh, people aren't going to drop by. Mm. And, yeah, so. um, I'll drop by sometimes oh, just you to better. surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> Our last issue, we discussed uh, why Wuthering Heights is so popular hmm. in Japan. And I spoke with Judith Pascal. Right. And I know that you've also spoken yeah, with her. Yeah. And, of course, we, talked, we could not talk about a true novel by Manai uh, Mizumura. I wanted to ask you many things about that. First mm -hmm. of all, it's so long. Yes, it is, right. <laughs> the funny thing is, when I signed up for it, somebody else had begun working on it. And she had trans. She had spent four years and was not even half finished with the first half. Everybody said this is really not going to go anywhere. <laughs> so, so they said, "Would you just take the second half?" Wow. And I, as I said, I had other projects uh, going on at the time. I was doing a really difficult Buddhist translation. I was doing Clouds Above the Hill, long classic by Shibaro Taro, and I was chairman of the English department, and I, I think I would have said no if they'd asked me to do the whole thing. But even half of it is still really long. Yeah, because it's I thought, two But I thought this volumes, is, right? like you say, some things are a once-in-a-lifetime chance, and you have to, you just have to say, uh, it'll work out. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know how I would do it, but I thought, I, I can't say no to this. And then you end up doing the whole thing anyway, but it all it did work <laughs> out. <laughs> and it was just a really great experience. It was just a, such a privilege to work on that book and to get to know Minai. I never have collaborated on a translation like that. Well, the Buddhist translations, yes, but to do a, a literary translation is quite different. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. Is the English version, did it come out in two volumes, or was ju that just the Japanese version? Um, the first edition come is in two volumes, and then the paperback is a single volume. Right. There seems to be some kind of discussion on the Internet about whether Mizumura was actually trying to replicate Wuthering Heights or not. Was that the idea? Well, I think she started with that. Okay. Yes, and I think you, you can't ignore it. It's definitely mm -hmm. there, but, but she didn't just, you know, mimic 
whether or not she, she took it beyond that. Oh, sure. And she created something that's also equally based on Japanese literary tradition. Mm-hmm. All of her novels, they all have um, a genre as part of the title. That's why this one is called A True Novel. Mm-hmm. It's, it's trying to write in Japanese a novel that is true in the sense about it's it's true because it's about her but it's also mm-hmm. true because it's it's totally fiction but, mm-hmm. and she was able to bring those together if you've read it you mm-hmm. understand mm-hmm. she she combines the she shows that's a tradition with the, the other tradition of the the, the grand novel right no <laughs> and, and and she did it Bronte so style. well but yes i think that it's very much so deliberate but there are other things in it. She also, the voice of the narrator is, uh, she's had in mind the narrators of the tale of Genji, mm-hmm. those female narrators, mm-hmm. the, the waiting women. So, And she's got a lot of soseki in there. And the more you look for, the more you find. Wow, <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to talk to you about Memories of Wind and Waves right. by uh, Sagano uh, Junichi. I read his Memories of Silk and Straw, and I'm totally hooked. Really love that book. Yeah. And so I'd really like to get a hold of a copy of The Memories of Wind and Waves. And well, you happen to have one in your hand. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> you have shown this to me. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. And uh, how does that compare to... Is this the second one or the first? Yes. No, this came out as uh, after the first one. But I was just really delighted to do it. This is a complete nonfiction. Mm-hmm. So I do both fiction and nonfiction. But... It's it's full of love, really. He 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 fell in love with his patients. He's a doctor, and he would go around to their houses, and they would tell him their life stories, and he would say, "Well, gee, somebody ought to make a book about that." Mm-hmm. And he would record them. and And the original book, it's not edited at all. It's just the way they spoke in their dialect, repeating, overlapping, interrupting each other, and. I had to comb that out a little bit, get the tangles out, and make it smoothen out into uh, English. So it was a challenge, and and figure out the dialect and all that. But the characters are so, he's right, they're just brilliant. Of course, that's part of his success as an author, too, is making them brilliant. Yeah, Um, but it's all in their own words. mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He just allows them to speak. And there's a guy, a catfish, Cube. They call him that because he would catch catfish by stripping himself naked and just wrapping a little straw around the end of what we will call his pole. And he would just dive down, and so his, he would say, you're warm enough if you just have that part covered, everything else, you know, and then you're the same temperature as the catfish, and they can't tell you're there. Oh, funny. Yeah, but, it, you know, people like that, you don't run into every day. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> It makes you wonder about, you know, the old days and yeah. now, and um, are those people still around? We just don't see them, or is it that everyone's kind of doing the more similar lives, so they don't develop maybe as their characters? It's a different world, I think. I think it really is a different world. The the way they would get married and, and the omiyais they had, and it's all in there. And, and this woman, she ran away from home again and again, and then her parents would find her and bring her back. She's the first one in the book. And it it just upends all of your stereotypes that you have about Japanese women, how demure they are. (laughs) She breaks every rule she can think of, and a few more. (laughs) (laughs) What a storyteller. Really beautiful. Yeah. And the uh, art is by his father, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. But but there's a lot in it. It's it's really very touching. Mm -hmm. And... uh, I definitely got that feeling from the first one. Mm. And I even wondered, because there were so many stories, and you figure he must have like decided not to tell some of them. Um, no. Well, we did the same thing. There were more in the original book. They didn't all make it into this book. Some of them, if there's a certain similarity, then sorry, we had to choose. <laughs> yeah, but even these books, they're not short either. 250 no. pages, yeah, this right. one, which would be similar yeah. to the other. Was this one of your uh, favorite books to translate? I think so. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was very memorable. I'm fond of. The, I'm fond of all those people. They're like people I know. Yeah. <laughs> 
What other uh, books have been favorites for whatever reason? Well, my standard answer to that is the book that I'm working on currently. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, which child do you like the best? It's, uh, right. you know, some of them okay, are better behaved than others, but you still, <laughs> you still have a soft spot for them. They, they each take a life of their own, don't they? <laughs> they do. They, they go on and you just wish them well, like, just like you would wish your children well. You're going off on your own. It's true. Yeah. But uh, some of the ones that have people have... Um, Remember, let's see, Waiting on the Weather. That's another nonfiction book. It's about uh, this woman who worked uh, with uh, Kurosawa on all oh, of his right. films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's full of insights. Uh, she's very funny. That was fun to work on as a big movie fan. And I've done poetry. I did Salad Anniversary. That was a major, the first tanka that I did. That was just when I started working here at Doshisha, so over 30 years ago, but it's still around. And I have to say, the very first books that I did are still in print. Not all of the books I've done are, in, are still in print, but the first two, it was an Abe Kobo book, Secret Rendezvous, by Enchi Fumiko, Masks. Oh, masks yeah. yeah, and those books have continued to do really well over the last 40 years. I was so lucky. People say, how can I do what you do? How can I be a translator? And how do you tell somebody, well, get lucky? <laughs> That's what happened to me. Well, you've Just, done a great job uh, as well, you know, and that, of course, helps uh, keep books in print. And I don't think uh, people realize the job that translators do do because they're the ones who bring the books to the rest of the world and allow them to read them because how many people can read a novel in Japanese? It's like every book has two authors. Certainly the translation process, it's not, you know, you can't just translate directly. And especially with uh, Japanese. It's, it's true. It's the whole I, I way think of thinking is romance different. languages or something, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of translating, I would think. Mm -hmm. And anyone would know who's used Google Translate. <laughs> you put in Japanese and you get funny English out the mm -hmm. other end. Yet most of the romance languages, you can get a really good mm -hmm. rendition mm -hmm. when you put it in. Yeah. So it's a it's a huge but it, it was a, a a bad translation that got me interested in translation in the first place, because it kind of revealed the process. I was in high school and I was reading. Um, I had to write a paper about Japanese literature on the recommendation of my teacher. He knew I had started studying Japanese, so I knew a little bit of the language. I only knew haiku, but he said, no, there's more. <laughs> so he said, no, go and find something, you know, find Mishima or somebody like that. So I went to the library and looked around, and I found uh, Soseki. I read something, and I thought, well, that was pretty good. I'll read another one. And the second one made me think, well, gee, he can't write English. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> and then I thought about it, and I realized, well, yeah, he can't write English. <laughs> it's actually not him, and it's not his fault. And I, and I thought again about what it means to be a translator, and I realized that that would be something valuable to do. And it was so, at the age of 17, I decided if I could, that that's what I would like to do. I would love to do a soseki, so yeah. I might have a chance. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Yeah, oh, Something is, something is cooking, that. but I can't yeah. say yet. <laughs> okay, we are on the edge so of stay our seats tuned, to find stay out. Stay tuned, yeah. No, I would, I would just love to do it. I'd also like to talk about The Great Passage by Shion Mura. It's a book I really love. At the beginning, it took me a while to get into it, but there's a lot of background to cover. And then when it took off, boy, I was hooked. Mm. And it is such a beautiful book. It gets really beautiful in the second half. Yeah. And uh, the story about these people coming together to make this great dictionary, maybe kind of like translating a true novel. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it took them 13 years. Yeah. And it's just really gorgeous. And it's right when dictionaries are disappearing. That's the other <laughs> irony of the whole thing. Because today my students don't use dictionaries. So it's really a tribute to all of those people who made all those dictionaries that we don't use anymore. <laughs> or that I still use them, but mm -hmm. I think they're, they're fading. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a book about lexicography yeah. yes. and dictionaries and making dictionaries. And, and passion. That's yes. the thing. The famous definition of a lexicographer is a, a harmless drudge. Samuel Johnson. He made the Dictionary of the English Language. 
and that's how he defines lick, which he is himself. Yes. So he's talking about himself, and he says mm -hmm. a harmless drudge. But these people are, they're certainly harmless, but they're, <laughs> they're filled with passion. Even the ones who say dictionaries, eh, they get caught up in it. It does affect everybody, and it shows you that really words are what connect us and how important they are to everybody, whoever you are. And there's also an underlying theme there, the Japanese work ethic, and putting your full heart and commitment into any job. Right. As we see the main character, Majime, who's working on the dictionary, his wife is running a restaurant. And um, with your permission, I would like to read a few oh. passages. Oh, how lovely. Because I think it really encapsulates a lot of what uh, Japan and the aesthetics mm -hmm. uh, of Japan are about and uh, the work ethic that goes into making those things into reality. So this is about Majime's uh, wife, and she runs a restaurant. She served them a selection of sashimi prepared with evident attention to temperature and thickness, followed by dishes such as deep-fried tofu stuffed with fermented soybeans and lightly oven-toasted. The timing of the presentation was excellent. <laughs> I mean, to me, that yeah, is yeah. just Japan. Here's a yeah. small restaurant. Yeah. It's just a neighborhood restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Yet they go through this, this art. Yeah, and the, the attention to detail and, and knowing what makes the difference between something ordinary and something really special. Now, I did have a, a couple questions okay. about a couple of passages. One that, because I don't know much about translation, but I have to ask you if this was your translation or if uh, this was something you came up with, because I laughed when I came across this, this great line, she felt like Moses at the Red Sea. I thought it was odd that there would be a Christian reference stuck into a novel with characters who are obviously living in a Buddhist country. I thought, well, maybe it, there was something that was too difficult for people to understand about, you know, the Japanese culture, and this was. But you can't. You can't it. just put in Christian culture into Japan. Fair it's enough. A, yeah, and that was actually a problem that we had in a true novel, because there's a lot of things about heaven and hell in there in Wuthering Heights. And it doesn't carry over into Japanese, and so we ended up, it just, uh, it didn't work. But it was, it was interesting to think about the differences. No. Yeah, I was, it's interesting that you say that you uh, wouldn't just insert a reference, a Christian um, reference, even though that probably most of the readers would be. Uh, yes, not they would be, but anyway. you wouldn't expect... But. Japanese people to know that. So it right. has to be authentic, whatever you would put in, something that they might reasonably know. And I, obviously the Red Sea, the parting mm -hmm. of the Red Sea is, is mm -hmm. famous enough that they do know it. Ah, that's interesting, yeah. too. I hadn't yeah. considered that, yeah. Um, another line I love just from living in Japan, the uh, paper project chief was described <laughs> as he was a thin, bespeckled man in his mid-30s. Uh -huh. And I thought, that is like... Everybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I thought that, but it was it hit me, you know, like yep. And well, that's her. That's definitely her. We we actually did a um, a tie down. We had a public conversation about the book here uh, at the school one year ago. It was really fun. I got to meet her, and uh, oh, wow. I didn't meet her while I was working on it, but when it was mm -hmm. finished, and uh, we talked about it. It was it was very fun. The novel is obviously very well written but I wanted to talk about some of the things that make it a great novel. Um, I think everyone knows when they read something that's great, but they might not necessarily know what is it that makes it great. Um, and I think as writers, we often uh, maybe don't try to make our writing even greater. But something that I really picked up on and was delighted with was, of course, the metaphor of the dictionary. Mm -hmm. The reason it's called the book is called The Great mm, Passage, mm. is that the dictionary has been described as like a ship in its passage across the ocean. Um, and the ocean is the ocean of words that's just sort of inchoate, and we can't deal with it unless we have something to impose order on it. Here's a passage. A dictionary is a ship that crosses the sea of words. People travel on it and gather the small points of light floating on the dark surface of waves. They do this in order to tell someone their thoughts accurately, using the best possible words. Without dictionaries, 
all any of us could do is linger before the vastness of the deep. <laughs> that's just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. And yeah. then it goes on, we need to build a ship suitable for an ocean crossing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, they decided to name the dictionary The Great Passage. Mm -hmm. This goes on for 13, I think it was 15 years in the end, wasn't yeah, it? probably. It, it yeah. took them because they went into the paper quality and the tint of the paper and the waxiness of the paper. Yes. <laughs> all very well done, not boring at all. Amazingly so, yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that. I oh, was fascinated no. by it. So Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I, I thought for sure And you sure start that caring about it. Yeah, Is it going to be waxy enough? <laughs> And I thought Majime was going to give that poor girl a whipping if she got it wrong. <laughs> right. In the end, she had this huge burden yeah. to choose the right paper in the end, and I thought, oh. Yeah, and he, and he, but he trusted her, and it's, it's also about these relationships and how, how each person grows into the role that they're given to Majime in the beginning, too, and people didn't know what to make of him. You know, he was... A, much, very much an odd fish in yeah. the ocean. <laughs> they, they all do rise to it because there's something about the greatness of what they're doing that captivates them all and, and makes them worthy of it. Well, the, the climax is actually, it's also almost an anticlimax, except that it's so beautifully written. It's not exactly a spoiler if I read it. Okay. Do, did you want to read it? I'll read it if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. The final dictionary, Majime looking at it. The box, dust jacket, and cover were all ultramarine blue, the color of the sea at night. The band was a pale cream, the color of moonlight. The inside cover was the same cream color, and the hanagire was the silver of the moon itself, shining in a dark sky. The title lettering was also silver, standing out boldly against the cover's dark blue. Closer examination showed a narrow, wave-like pattern in silver along the base of the box and dust cover. On the spine was the outline of an ancient sailing ship, just cresting a swell. The front and back covers were marked unobtrusively with a crescent moon and ship. Wow. I mean, I can and of course, it. that describes the actual book in Japanese, which is made like that. The English version doesn't look like that. It has a nice cover. But oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the actual way that the the, the they the book presented looks the like. book itself. Yes. Ah, yeah. oh, that is great. Yeah, right. Well, just like a dictionary. <laughs> well, then after that passage, again, the writing was so well done. They finished the dictionary. And from then on, the writing reflects this success by backing up the metaphor of the ship's passage, complete with the seafaring terms. Mm -hmm. So we have, after the month-long all-hands-on-deck, right. round-the-clock yeah. proofreading, right. yeah. we have, the great passage was blessed to have a devoted crew. Dozens of pairs of eyes had checked the proofs. From stem to stern. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that was just... Now, not all great. of those are in the, in the Japanese, but I feel that if you can use something like that, she would have used it if she had it. See, and this if we is a have good translation. Those, yeah, that's what she wants to do in Japanese, and so you have to avail yourself of the things that are there begging to be used in English. Yeah. That's right, and oh. I, that's the difference between maybe yeah. a good translator and a bad translator. <laughs> Oh. Is being able to, you yeah. know, make so that was fun. That live. was very fun, and she does use some, so you can see. Oh, okay. she's go going for that. <laughs> right. Then I'll I'll go with her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, beautiful. So loved. Or it, it springs a leak. Or yeah. something <laughs> at one point. Oh, no. <laughs> Just as long as the dictionary yeah. doesn't sink. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. But with those yeah. waxy pages, yeah, it, it might survive. Be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what else are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on a book about Kyoto business. I would never have picked it, and yet uh, it was suggested to me, and as I work on it, it's fascinating. It's written by a doshisha professor right next door here, and it's about how Kyoto has the most heritage industries, old businesses that have been around for two or three hundred years, and also the most uh, cutting-edge, high-tech companies of any city in the world. It's unique in both aspects. And so he's taking a real close look at this. How did this come about? What, you know, how did Kyoto achieve this balance? And, and 
the old ones are still going strong, and the new ones are also. And there are ways in which they mesh together, uh, work together, and it's uh, so. I've just started it, but it's really interesting. <laughs> so it's um, it's the old companies and the new companies yeah. and how they're working together. Uh -huh. It's not the same company, no the company that's doing new things. No, they're different. Okay. No, but they all thrive in this city of Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And what is it about Kyoto? That's what he's looking at. Uh, it's really an, an interesting book. So that's one. And I just finished. Book six of Ryoma ga yuku, mm -hmm. which is uh, we're calling it Ryoma with an exclamation mark. It's about the uh, the great uh, hero of the Bakumatsu period, just before the Meiji Restoration, and that's a very rollicking, wonderful book oh, with lots of adventure and history and interesting characters again and uh, quotable quotes from Ryoma. He's just he's mm -hmm. just. He's very popular. Oh, yeah. he's one, and he's popular because of this book. This is the book that okay. made people fall in love with him, and uh, I'm I'm there. I'm in love too. So that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I have one more. When I took this one on, I said I'll do it if I get to do the book where he dies. That's the one. So that's the one waiting for me next. So I, I just finished. I'm going to give it a rest for a little bit. But again, you really get caught up in these people's lives and uh, the things they're doing. It's hard because they all speak a different dialect. I was going to say, that's old Japanese. It's old Japanese. And, uh, well, the book and isn't, dialects. but the, the dialect is. Mm -hmm. and, and she was really good about bringing it out. Although you can't, even in Japanese, you can't bring it out too much or people can't read it exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it again even really in bad. Japanese he's just sort of sometimes he'll just say he said in dialect without reproducing oh, really? it so I feel justified in doing that too mm -hmm. <laughs> so. but you learn a lot about the Japanese language from doing this it's very it's very interesting you get lots of insights into it and I've learned the Nagasaki word for kiss oh. back then which they didn't even Kissing wasn't a thing. So when they said it, this girl, Geisha, says it to Droma, he doesn't know what she's talking about. He f eventually figures it out. But <laughs> <laughs> but the word is, uh, I have to share it, it's amakuchi. Oh, Which means sweet mouth. Yeah, isn't it? But it's a lovely nice. word. Amakuchi shite. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, very, yeah, sexy, yeah, it's, it? it is. It is. Yeah. The book has that too. Yeah. So it's a very provocative as it well. Is. And yep. Well, I learned a lot of uh, Japanese words and concepts, uh, even in, you know, just the great passage. Mm. I don't know um, how you... I didn't leave them out. Yeah, I yeah. left them in. If you, if you don't know Japanese, too bad. You will, but then we finish the book. You can tell. <laughs> you'll you know, you'll know a anyway. little bit of a little bit of it anyway. Get, like, I wanted to give people a glimpse of what Japanese is like. Yeah, um, and you can't talk down to your reader either and just right. presume they're not interested or don't know anything. I think it strikes the right balance of giving enough that people who do know can learn something. Mm -hmm. Those who don't, uh, you know, can tell from yeah. context, right. basically, right. what it is. Yeah. There was a passage about the itinerant priest looking at Mount, oh, Mount yeah. Fuji. Right. And there's Saigyo. a word for that. Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, There's a word for that. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> and that's Japan, yeah. and that's yeah. Japanese, right. and that really captures... Yeah. You know, the richness of the language yeah, and, the and, and their respect for their literary tradition. So there's so much to gain from reading these books yeah. in translation. Yeah. How many more books are available now than there were, say, 30 years ago? Oh, yeah. Well, when I was in high school that time, there was, you know, this was the entire extent of what you could read. There was just a few volumes. Yeah. And now, I can't keep up with it. So maybe now is a good time for people to get into translation if they're interested. Why not? Give it a try. I think it's a I think it's a really fun project. I always tell my students I teach at a women's college and I say, you know, translation is good for women because you can combine it with other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, men can too, but let's face it, women often, especially in Japan, you, you you're at home and you have children. I would just like I said, I would wait till the kids went to sleep and then that was my time. And you yeah. can't do that with every job. What else am I working on? I'm doing another um, Minae novel. It's wow. called Shishosetsu from Left to Right. And it, it, it is a true I novel based mm -hmm. on her experience and how she decided to go back. She grew up in, in New York from the age of 12. And then uh, after 20 some years, she decided to go back to Japan and become a Japanese writer. Writing in Japanese wow. is what that means. <laughs> Not yeah. writing in English. And she, she made that choice. And it... Uh, it's uh, a really fascinating 
book, which will come out uh, September 2019. So mark your calendar. Be sure to get that up on the Books on Asia site. Yeah, Very good. So that'll be my fourth book with her. So that's nice. I hope she keeps writing more. She has a new one that yeah. she's working on. So I hope we get to do at least two more. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It was a very ple great pleasure. Yeah, it was great to also to come to Doshisha. Mm -hmm. I you know, had never been here before and you know, mm -hmm. took a little tour of the campus and such. And a very beautiful campus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kyoto's lovely, isn't it? We have a lovely location. We're right by the Gosho. So it's just yeah. Yeah, lots of green around. And again, very, very happy. And I hope to see you again. All right. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Books on Asia podcast, produced and edited by Michael Palmer. Logo by Alex Kerr. Sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years. They can be found at www.stonebridge.com. For more interviews, book reviews, and other features, visit the Books on Asia website at booksonasia.net.